Well, welcome everybody. We're happy to have Ali Akbar Daimi here from Wustel. This is the, the first part in a two-part mini-series. So Ali is speaking today and um, Kenji Fukaya will speak next week as a continuation of this. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, Ali is gonna tell us about three manifold representations and the atiyah Fleur conjecture. All right, thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here it's for the second time. Um, first, I'd like to thank the organizer for organizing such a great uh, you know, weekly seminar. Um, I, you know, usually Fridays are not so good for me, so I couldn't attend as many talks as I wanted, but I watched, you know, many of the videos and they're all great. So thanks to organizers for the seminar. Um, before I also start my talk, I wanna, uh, actually I wanna start with a disclaimer. So I think about a week ago, Kenji and I negotiated who should talk about what. And as I was preparing my talk, I noticed that Kenji got the better half of the deal. So today I'm going to talk about, you know, um, some of the stuff that I'm going to talk about are shamelessly based on the same slides that I had, um, you know, from a talk in the same seminar about more than a year ago. And some of it are based on, you know, stuff that uh, many people in the audience know more than me about them, but hopefully there will be something, you know. Uh, useful for you guys. Um, so this is, okay, this is a symplectic uh, seminar. Let me start with a definition of my symplectic manifolds. Um, so I'm gonna look at uh, the surface of a uh, certain genus, sigma, and look at the representations of the fundamental group of sigma, but after removing a puncture. So there's a point P I move that, I look at representations of this going to SU2. And uh, the condition that I require is that if you look at the conjugacy class of a loop, which goes around this point P, um, <clears throat> then I require that uh, that conjugacy class goes to the element negative one inside SU2. So once you fix some um, standard presentation for the fundamental group of, um, your surface, there it's um, it's quite easy to write uh, to identify your character variety with a space of two G tuples um, of elements of SU two such that uh, the product of the commutators A i and B i is equal to negative one. Something that I forgot to say here is that uh, you look at a space of representations modular conjugation. So you also do the same thing here. So if you, two representations are the same, uh, two representations are related by conjugating with respect to some element of SU2, gonna regard them as the same ones. Um, so it's actually a, more useful for us to think about some uh, equivalent characterization of the character variety, which is in terms of uh, flat uh, bundles. So if you have um, some, let's say, so you have some element of your character variety, then associated to this guy, you can define, um, so it, it's a, so you would get some representations of the fundamental group of, um, complement of the uh, complement of sigma and, what I'm gonna use is that, so SU2 acts on a three-dimensional vector space, which is the Lie algebra of SU2. And this action is given by conjugation. So you get associated to this action, you can define a vector bundle well associated with this action as well as the representation, um, which is a vector bundle over sigma. Notice that uh, because the conjugacy class uh, around this point P goes to negative one, um, this bundle extends over sigma. It's an oriented rank three flat ve vector bundle. And the condition, this condition that the, around the point we send the conjugacy class of gamma to negative one implies that uh, this bundle has, uh, the second HTML within class of this bundle is equal to the Poincaré dual of a point. So it's a non-trivial SO3 bundle over sigma. Is it over uh, sigma or sigma minus P? Well, just because of the condition that uh, phi of gamma 
is negative one, it extends over the point P. I see, thank you. Um, so now, okay, so using this construction, we can give uh, some equivalent description of the character, right? So it's gonna be the space of all flat connections on this fixed bundle, which has this HTFL Whitney class. It's an SO3 bundle. Uh, and we're looking at the space of all flat connections and this bundle modulo a certain automorphism. So we look at identity component of the automorphism group of our SO3 bundle and we mod out by this group. So two connections are the same if they are related to each other uh, by the conjugation. Uh, by, uh, by pulling back a connection with respect to your automorphism. Okay, so uh, what is nice about this character variety, uh, this character variety, I'm going to call it the odd character variety as opposed to some other choice of character varieties, which is called even character variety, and that requires this phi of gamma to be one. Um, but the good thing about the odd character variety is that it has some nicer regularity properties. So in particular, it's a smooth manifold. Uh, its dimension is 6G minus six. Uh, in fact, it's a, in fact, it's a, a symplectic manifold. And this symplectic manifold can be thought as some symplectic quotient. So uh, there's a nice description of this uh, space as a symplectic quotient. Um, so to describe it as a symplectic quotient, what you do is that, um, so you look at the space of all SO3 connections on your bundle. It's not, I mean, it's not such a scary space. In fact, it's just an infinite dimensional vector space. It's an affine space modeled and, um, one formed and sigma with coefficients in our vector space. Um, whenever you have two such one forms, um, you can take their wedge product and use a pairing on V to get a two form and sigma and then integrate it over sigma. So that's going to be our symplectic form and this infinite dimensional uh, vector space. And some, okay, so this is an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold and, and this infinite dimensional symplectic manifold, we have the action of this automorphism group G. So, so we had this group G, which acts on A of sigma, so remember that this was the automorphisms of our vector bundle B. So you can pull back a connection again to get another connection. Notice that here I'm not requiring connections to be flat. So at this point, A of sigma consists of all SO3 connections. Still, you can act on this space of such connections by taking pullback. And something nice happens is that, so this action is in fact, um, action on this infinite dimensional space is Hamiltonian uh, with the moment map, which can be characterized in terms of curvature of connection. So for any connection A, the moment map is gonna be, uh, you first take the curvature. So that's gonna be a two form with values in uh, your vector bundle. But by taking Hodge star of this two form, you would get a zero form. And that's, that can be identified with the Lie algebra of our Lie group here, which is an um, and the space of automorphisms. So in particular, if you think about this, so if you look at mu inverse of zero and you mod out by G, it's gonna be exactly the character variety. So um, another way of saying is that the character variety is the symplectic quotient of A of sigma by this um, action of the Lie group. So this way of thinking about um, the character variety goes back to Atian but So they, I mean, um, you know, it's, it's true that it's infinite dimensional, um, you know, taking, you know, identifying a character variety as the infinite dimensional symplectic, co symplectic quotient of an infinite dimensional space. And, you know, we have to be careful if you want to work with this 
you know, characterization, but it's usually um, very helpful. Okay, so let's look at some examples of this character variety. So in the case that genus is equal to zero, uh, we would get, oh, there, is, there is no element in the character variety. It's just simple exercise to see that this is empty. And in the case that genus is equal to one, the character variety has only one point. Things become interesting once we go to dimension larger than one. So for instance, in the case that dimension is one, um, sorry, in the case that genus is equal to two, where the dimension is supposed to be six, uh, we can identify the character right as the intersection of two quadrics in P5. So this is, I think, a result which is due to new state. Um, okay, so um, another thing that I, I mean, this is not really, really an example, but because it shows up, let me also make it clear that if you have a disconnected surface, so this union of two surfaces, sigma one and sigma two, the character variety of this guy is just gonna be the product of the character variety of sigma one and sigma two. Okay, um, let's also review some basic facts about the topology of the character variety. Um, so this character variety is always simply connected. So pi one is equal to zero. And pi two, of course, you know, when we are Genus is well in genus zero case we don't have anything to talk about. In genus one, of course, pi two is trivial. But once genus is greater than one, so greater than or equal to two, pi two is equal to z. And it's a nice symplectic manifold that we can do a lot of you know constructions in terms of holomorphic curves without too much difficulties. So the key point is that this symplectic manifold is in fact uh, monotone. So if you look at the first gen class of the uh, symplectic manifold, it is gonna be twice the generator of the second cohomology. So the second cohomology is Z and C1 is twice the generator. And with, with some choice, a good choice of normalization of your symplectic form, it's going to be twice the cohomology class, which is represented by your symplectic form and the character variety. I'm not going to be very consistent with the choice of uh, with this constant through my talk, but uh, it's not going to be also that important. The key important is that it's just a positive multiple of uh, this guy. So it's, it's a monotone symplectic manifold. So Ali, um, I'm just yeah. confused about uh, the middle line about the disjoint union. So the definition depends on choosing this point where we have minus one monodromy. Wouldn't that right. mess up that equality? Yeah, so this, you should partly regard it as a definition for disconnected, but what you can also identify it in a way that, okay, so when you're, okay, so there are two ways to think about the character, right? One was in terms of flat connections. So it's like flat connections and sigma one distance sigma two and, and a bundle, which is non-trivial on both sigma one and sigma two. So it's just finding a flat connection on sigma one and a finding a flat connection on sigma two. So that way you can just see that it's the product. But if you wanna also think about it in terms of representations, you have to, uh, yeah, I gotta be more careful there. So I have to remove a point from sigma one a point from sigma two and I work um, you know, with the re representations of the complements of the fundamental, you know, the product of the, you know, the you know, fundamental groups of sigma one and sigma two. Okay, thank you. That's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't clear, you know, when I talk about character right of sigma one and sigma two, what bundle I'm using here. Thank you. Uh, great, okay, so, right. So up to this point, we were talking about the symplectic manifold. Now we wanna discuss the Lagrangians, which would show up in our story. In fact, the Lagrangians are gonna be um, constructed based on three manifolds. So let's look at this schematic picture, uh, which is uh, 
first presenting. Uh, so we, we start with the surface sigma, which is disconnected and has two connected components, sigma one and sigma two. And we also, so we also fix two base points on each of them, P1 and P2. So this is related to Nate's question that we have to pick a base point on each connected component. In addition to that, we also fix a three manifold with boundary sigma and and also we also pick a one dimension, a properly embedded one dimensional sub manifold of our three manifold Y. So here our three manifold is really this region. So we also pick a um, one dimensional sub manifold. E. It doesn't have to be connected although in this, in this picture it's connected. Uh, we pick one such properly embedded one manifold uh, what the boundary has to be the, uh, these two points, P1 and P2. Once we have this, we can define some sub uh, some, some space which is similarly defined as the odd character variety. We are looking at the representations of the complement of E into SU2, such that if you take a loop which goes around your one dimensional manifold. So it's the monodromy of your uh, one dimensional sub manifold. So that monodromy has to be mapped into negative one. And you also look at the space of all such um, uh, representations modulo the conjugation action again. Okay, so this is description which is similar to the description in terms of representations, but we can also give a description in terms of uh, connections. So let's fix, let's, let me see if I can make this work. Um, so let's take an SO3 bundle on your three manifold. This time, this SO3 bundle is determined, uh, again, it's determined by second H2 for Whitney class. So I just have to tell you what the H2 for Whitney class is. And this time, it's the Poincare dual of this one dimensional self manifold. And that's why I didn't require to be oriented because I don't need any orientation on this guy. So I just need uh, to look at the Poincare dual of this guy. I'm going to denote it again, this bundle by E. And you, another, an equivalent characterization of this space is that you're looking at flat connections on this bundle um, and module the automorphisms of your bundle E here. I guess I'm using the same G as before, but this time G is the space of automorphisms of our new bundle E. It's, it's on a three-dimensional space. And ideally, like the case of odd character variety, I like to say that this is a nice, smooth, uh, space, but that doesn't happen in general. So you can just get some badly cut down spaces like this. So it's good to have some flexibility in the definition. So instead of connections, which are flat, which means that the curvature of alpha is equal to zero, F of alpha, which denotes the curvature, we're gonna um, look at we're gonna add the perturbation term. I'm not, I don't wanna to spend too much time on the perturbation term. I'm just gonna make this comment that it's supposed to be gradient-like curvature and perturbation term. But uh, roughly speaking, what you're doing is that you're giving yourself some degree of freedom to perturb and the flat equation. And I'm gonna write L, H of Y and E for the space of uh, solutions of this guy. And something which, uh, yeah. well, first let's ignore the perturbation term. Uh, something that you can do is that you can just take a representation or a flat connection and restrict it to the boundary. So this way you would get a map from this space into chi of sigma, uh, the odd character variety. Uh, the same is true if we if you're careful with the perturbation term. So basically the, the support of the perturbation term is in the interior of our three manifold. We don't mess up with the flat equation on the boundary and you still have the restriction map to the space of connections. So as the name suggests, we're trying to get in, uh, some Lagrangians inside chi of sigma 
And in fact, it says theorem, which is due to Harold. It says that this guy, uh, together with this map iota, gives us an immersed Lagrangian at when uh, our when our perturbation term h is chosen generically. Okay, so for each choice of generic h, we have some um, Lagrangian. And now the question is that what happens if we change our uh, perturbation terms? If you have two different perturbation terms, h and h prime, are they related to each other in a nice way? And the answer is yes. Um, so for two different choices of h and h prime, such perturbation, you know, the, the two Lagrangians that we would get are Lagrangian cobordant to each other. So this is essentially due to Harold. Um, he looks at, I mean, in, in the, you know, Harold looks at a actually more complicated situation. Um, and he gets some even, you know, better result that I'm gonna get to the better result in, in a few slides. And Ali, can okay. I ask, um, are, are there any um, like notable special cases where it's actually an embedded Lagrangian? Yeah, that's a great question, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna give actually some examples of that in a second, yeah. Okay. And there are actually some very nice cases that this is embedded and the embedded case is actually, you know, uh, at least for this, for for the sake of today's talk, is going to be the central case uh, for us. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah. But what are what are some examples as uh, Ned uh, as Nate asked? So let's let's look at let's actually let's just start with some examples of a uh, pair of three manifolds and E. There's a there's a good family of examples that uh, you can construct from three manifolds with boundary. Now let's say that M is a three manifold with just boundary sigma and G. So it has a connected boundary. What you can do is that you can take the boundary sum of this guy with T2 times an interval. So this side is supposed to be T2 times I and this side is just M. And what you do is that you connect and you do the boundary sum along one of the boundary components of T2 times I and the boundary of sigma J. So this uh, boundary of M. So this way, this genus increases by one because this boundary component is just a connected sum of sigma G minus one and T2. And there is an additional boundary component, which is T2. Um, so this is, one reason that this is also nice is that remember that the character variety of T2 is just a point. So what you're really getting uh, is, you know, a log, at the end of the day, you would get a Lagrangian in the odd character variety of sigma G, some Riemann surface, not a disconnected one. Um, okay, I also have to fix some choice of an arc and a properly embedded uh, guy. And what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to take a point inside T2 and point times I would give me this part. Okay. So this is exactly sort of a three manifold and an embedded sub manifold that I can fit into the construction of the last slide. And out of this pair, I can get an immersed Lagrangian, at least after some small perturbation. And in some nice cases, this is actually going to be an embed, sorry, let me see if I can make this. Work. Okay, so there, one special case is that when M is, um, is S one times, oops, I didn't mean to do that. So when M is just S one times D two, so the boundary is gonna be just um, Sigma one, genus one surface. And in this case, what we would get is that we would get a Lagrangian. Remember that the genus increases by one, so it would be a Lagrangian, the odd character variety of uh, a genus two surface. So it's gonna be a Lagrangian sphere, in fact, Lagrangian S3. And these are actually important Lagrangians. Uh, they were studied in a work of uh, Ivan Smith, they showed that if 
uh, you use different parametrization of the boundary, you would get different Lagrangian spheres. And if you pick this parametrizations in a nice way, you can get generators of the Fukai category of uh, this symplectic manifold, chi of sigma two. You can uh, generalize this construction to the case that instead of this solid terms, S1 times D2, you have a handle body of genus G minus one. So it's a ball with G minus one handles. And that would give us a Lagrangian inside chi of sigma G and the character, odd character variety of the genus G surface. Uh, in fact, it's going to be a Lagrangian, uh, which is diffeomorphic to S1, S3, 2G copy, uh, sorry, G copies of, I don't know what happened here. Um, G copies of S3, G minus one copies of S3. So it has to be dimension uh, three, G minus three. And yeah, I guess the dimension uh, is correct. And uh, this is this is the sorry, this is a slight generalization of this example that we would get. Uh, there are more interesting examples that you can construct by looking at um, by looking at other three manifolds with the same boundary. Like for instance, you know, a nice family which a nice uh, family of three manifolds that which are important in not um, you know. In low dimension topology are the not complements. So if M is a not complement, we can this this way you can construct other Lagrangians in chi of sigma two, and these are not usually um, embedded. So usually immersed Lagrangians. Um, I don't want to get uh, too many examples. I'm not going to try to uh, initially. I had like an example of the trifold. I said that's probably too much, but you know you can try to cook up some examples out of like not complements this way. Okay, um, great. So what is, okay, so this is the first place that uh, we make a contribution. So, okay, so we have this Lagrangians, but now let's assume that we are in a case that this Lagrangians is embedded. I think Kenji is probably gonna uh, mention uh, you know, some, something related to this theorem in the case that is immersed. But for uh, let's for now assume that this Lagrangian is embedded. Then what uh, something that we can say is that this is in fact monotone in the sense that the Maslow number is a positive multiple of uh, the symplectic uh, structure. This the the map induced by the symplectic form and embedded and you know and disks with boundary in, you know disk inside and your character variety with boundary in the Lagrangian. Uh, we can say, I think even a bit more here. So we can even say that the minimal Maslow number of this Lagrangian number is equal to four. So the image of this guy is going to be four times C. Uh, maybe I'll make, I think I will probably make some comments related to this theorem later in the talk. Um, but let me just say that this is a good setup to, uh, to apply uh, the construction of Lagrangian floor homology. In fact, this is a case that the definition of Lagrangian floor homology is not that much involved. So there's a variation of Lagrangian floor homology for monotone uh, Lagrangians, which is due to O. And here we're gonna apply it to get a Lagrangian floor homology of these two Lagrangians, uh, which are associated. So we start with Y and V, we'll pick another uh, Y prime and E prime. I guess an important assumption here is that they have the same boundary. So boundary of Y and boundary of Y prime, they are both equal to sigma. They are identified with this um, with the surface sigma. So we can, um, these are Lagrangians in the same uh, character variety and we can uh, just look at the Lagrangian floor homology of these two guys, the construction, uh, yeah, the version of Lagrangian floor homology, which is defined by O. There is in fact some more structure on Lagrangians here uh, and Lagrangian floor homology here. So this is, uh, and it's um, maybe it's not completely clear from our paper. It's not, we really didn't get into details of this that much, but this is implicit in our construction. Um, so first, uh, 
note that there is a pre-quantum bundle and, and a ca uh, character variety. So there is a, um, <clears throat> there's a line bundle, there's an S1 bundle over your character variety, and it comes with a connection theta such that um, the connection, the curvature of this connection is some correct multiple of uh, your symplectic form. This is probably one of the places that my conventions with the symplectic structure is not consistent. Um, so we can, of course, here, because we were talking about S1 bundles, the connection is not anything more than just uh, one form um, and this space. So theta is a one form and this manifold of dimension 6g minus 5. And just this condition implies that it defines a contact structure on chi of sigma. Um, OK, so this is some additional structure that we have on our symplectic manifold. We have also something related to the Lagrangians. So uh, again, let's fix y and e as before. And after a perturbation, I'm going to drop the perturbation term whenever it's convenient. So, but we have after a slight perturbation, we can get an immersed uh, Lagrangian inside chi of sigma. And the point is that, in fact, you can do more. You can define a lift of this immersion into this space H, and that gives us um, some, in fact, immersed Lagrangian inside H. So what happens is that. Um, this CS is parallel, it's a section, I mean, you can pull back this bundle over this guy and you can think about this CS as a section of the bundle with a connection, and this guy is parallel with respect to that connection. So this is equivalent to say that this guy is an immersed Lagrangian. Okay, so the immersed Lagrangians that we talked before are immersed Lagrangians. In fact, um, I told you that uh, uh, oh, okay. I, I was going to also make a comment about uh, this guy. That this guy is not completely well defined. It's well defined up to a phase. So, um, in general, you might have to multi. I mean, um, there's not a canonical choice of this section. So it's canonical up to up to some global multiplication by some constant inside S one. Something again that essentially Harold proved. Um, the reason that I say essential because he, he, proved, he worked in a slightly different context is that um, this, this guy, well, it's an immersed Lagrangian, uh, but also now we have, I can now let's put H back. So now we have immersed Lagrangians for different choices of perturbation terms. And what he showed is that this immersed Lagrangian. Uh, is independent of uh, edge up to Lagrangian cobordism. So if you pick two different choices of edge to get two different immersed Lagrangians, they are Lagrangian cobordant to each other. Okay, but what can we do with this additional structure when we have floor homology? So now let's say that we, we have Y and E, we pick another one, Y prime and E prime, and we want to see what, uh, what uh, what does this structure give us at the level of uh, floor homology? So the point is that for any connection B in the intersection of these two Lagrangians, um, so when we look at the intersection, uh, we have this CS associated to this guy and associated to this guy, which I call it CS prime. So we have two points in an S1 fiber of this pre-quantum bundle on the same fiber. So you can ask how they differ, uh, how much they differ. And this way you would get an element of S1. And this difference between the phases of these two guys can be used to define a filtration and uh, Lagrangian floor homology. So, I mean, you might ask, okay, so this is, this is an S1 valued function on the, intersection points of the Lagrangians. It's not real value to define a filtration. The point is that the grading here is also uh, Z mod four valued. Um, and you can just lift the Z, 
you know, you can just lift this DMOD for grading into Z grading. And once you do that, you can also lift this S1 function to an R valued function on the intersection that would give us um, a filtration here. It's a filtration in the sense that also, you know, if you have a, a holomorphic curve from one intersection point to another intersection point, then, um, you know, filtration drops. So the, the value that we're getting here drops by um, some non-trivial constant. Um, so in summary, at the end of the day, what we would get is that the Lagrangian floor homology groups, uh, which is Z mod four graded. So the four here is coming from um, minimal Maslow number. So it's Z mod four graded because minimal Maslow number is four. It's filtered because of this whole CS structure that I was talking about. And it's defined over Z. So you can, or, so you can orient the modular spaces and show that you know, Lagrangian floor homology is defined over Z. But this is, the story here is not at least, you know, the way that we do it is not completely satisfactory in a sense that, okay, we show that there are some orientations and these orientations are coherent and we can define Lagrangian floor homology and so on. But it would be more desirable to say that these Lagrangians in fact the orientations on the modular spaces are coming from the addition, some additional structure on these Lagrangians. In fact, we conjecture that these Lagrangians are, they admit canonical spin structures and the orientation of the modular spaces is coming from these spin structures. But in any case, there's a way to orient them. And in some cases, you can say that there is at most one way of orienting them. So that's, that in those cases, you know, basically there's this conjecture as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me, let me stop here and see if there are any questions. Any questions up to this point? Okay, so if there are no questions, let me get to the main tier. So let's say that, okay, this is just a schematic picture of what, I, what I've been using up to this point. So you have Y and E uh, on one side. So it's a three manifold with the choice of an embedded uh, one manifold. Same, you have something similar Y prime and E prime. They, they have the same boundary and something obvious that you can do immediately is to glue along their boundaries. So this way you would get a close three dimensional manifold Y till by taking the connected sum of y and y prime. You can also go with this e and e prime to get um, an, a closed uh, one manifold uh, inside y till, which again, it defines an SO3 bundle. So basically you're gluing the SO3 bundle uh, determined by e to the SO3 bundle determined by e prime. Um, so so, okay, so associated to this guy, we have um, some sort of floor homology, which is called instant of floor homology. I'm gonna say a few words about it, um, but let me first state the theorem that for any such uh, instant of, uh, for any pair of Y and E and Y prime and E prime is here. So I'm, I'm assuming some condition which have been implicit uh, for this slide is that also this, the Lagrangians associated to these guys are embedded. I guess up to this point, I didn't need that, but for this theorem, I'm assuming that the Lagrangians associated to Y, E and Y prime and E prime are embedded. So we can define this Lagrangian floor homology. And <clears throat> okay, so there is this Lagrangian floor homology and then there is this uh, instant of floor homology. So this one is defining the context of case share and this one is defining the context of, um, um, you know, symplectic and you know, Lagrangians inside symplectic manifolds. And the main theorem is that as Z mod four graded filtered abelian groups, these two guys are isomorphic to each other. And as a consequence of this, notice that it's not clear that this is actually depends only on Y tilde and E tilde, at least it's not clear from the definition, but because it is isomorphic to this guy, justifies this notation here 
SI of Y tilde and E tilde. It depends only on Y tilde and E tilde. It's gonna call it symplectic in Santon homology of these guys. Um, let me also make a comment because I'm worried that maybe I'm not, I don't get to that at the end of my, this is related to one of my last slides, that the, this version of instant floor homology was defined by floor, but it's been, you know, it's, of course, you know, it, it shows up, you know, in a lot of words, but um, Kronheim and Morovka actually developed this, you know, they have a lot of interesting uh, words uh, based on these guys. In fact, maybe, you know, um, there's also a version of this invariant, which is frame floor homology, a special case of that. And on this side, there's a work of, uh, you know, this sort of three manifold invariants, uh, which show up in the work of um, uh, Chris Woodward and uh, Katrin Wertheim. So I, I, there's a special case, uh, you know, there's a corollary of this theorem, which it, it says that some invariant, which is defined by Kronheim and Morovka, and some invariant defined by Wertheim and Woodward are isomorphic to each other. So that's in my last slide. In case I don't get it, I want to mention it here. Um, okay, but I mean, I think I'm not going to assume that uh, I think it's probably fair. Uh, it's not fair to assume that uh, people know here what instant on floor homology is. So I'm just going to say a few words about it. But I'm worried that maybe you know, what I'm going to say, if you already don't know what instantons are, maybe it's not going to be useful. But I'll try to say what how symplectic topologies should think about instantons in a second. Let's, let's first say that roughly speaking, how instanton floor homology is defined. It's very it's defined in a very similar way to Lagrangian floor homology. So what you have to do is that it's a homology of a chain complex. Um, the chain group is generated by, oh, there's a typo here. It's not generated by the homology of chain complex. It's generated by perturbed flat connections. And our three manifold on our bundle E tilt. Uh, so something, uh, at least if we don't have to make perturbations, something which is topological, you know, it's, the board is not always ideal. Sometimes you have to deal with perturbations, um, but this is not so bad. But the more interesting part, at least, you know, in terms of geometry is what you need to do with differential. So to make an analogy with Lagrangian floor homology, in Lagrangian floor homology, you have to look at holomorphic strips. You have to look at solutions of cauchy riemann equation. Here, that equation is replaced by an equation which is called ASD equation. So it's an equation uh, for um, um, connections on four manifolds. So if you have a connection on a four manifold X, then you can take its curvature. It's going to be a two form. So your four manifold is supposed to be Riemannian. And what you can do with the Riemannian is to take uh, hydro star of that two form to get another two form. And what you want is that FA plus star of FA and to be zero. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that probably, I mean, if you already haven't seen it, it might not mean so much to you. But uh, what is true is that, okay, so in the, in the definition of instant of floor homology, what you do is that you look at uh, ASD equations on R times Y. I, next, I wanna talk about, I mean, I wanna discuss some way of some good, some symplectic way of thinking about um, the ASD equations. So if you're not so happy with this, let me uh, try, uh, let me try something else. Um, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna focus on the ASD equation in a special case, in the case that your four manifold is the product of a two dimensional disk and a Riemann surface sigma. Um, so, and I'm gonna use a product matrix. So just the standard metric DS, uh, DS squared plus DT squared on the two dimensional disk and some Riemannian metric on sigma. So then, any connection on this four manifold can be written in this way. 
Okay, what are the terms here? So A is the connection on X. Uh, here, alpha is the component of the connection which tell you how to differentiate in the sigma direction. So it, you can think about this as a map from D2 into the space of connections on sigma. For any point in D2, you look at the sigma direction and that would give you, you restrict your connection to the sigma direction that would give you a connection. So this way you would get a map from D2 into the space of all connections. And phi and psi tells you that how your connection vary in the S and T direction. So if I wanna be a little bit more clear here, alpha, phi and psi are zero forms and are for each, for, let me just be a little bit more precise here. For each S and T, this is a zero form on our surface with values in B. So it's a section of our vector bundle B over sigma. Um, okay, so one way of thinking about these two components, phi and psi, is that they define a connection on some bundle. So phi ds plus psi dt, it defines a connection and a bundle with the base d2 and the fiber a sigma. And the bundle is trivial, it's just d2 times a sigma. So it, that tells you that as you point it, as you vary the point S and T inside DT, how you should do you know, parallel transport. So once you write down, uh, decompose your connection A, the antel self duality equation can be written in this form. Or probably this one is not maybe that much better if you just if if you're looking at it for the first time, it's, it's probably not that much better than this one. But it turns out that all the terms here, they have um, topological interpretation. And this is, I think, an observation which is due to Chilabek, uh, Rita, Gaia, and Solomon, that you can basically give a symplectic description of this equation. Remember that this A of sigma is a, a symplectic manifold with some Hamiltonian G action. In general, what you can do is that you can start with some arbitrary symplectic manifold with some Hamiltonian G action. So M and omega is symplectic manifold and uh, with a G action and mu is the moment map of our Hamiltonian action. Another piece of information that we need is some principal bundle over a two dimensional disk with a structure group. G. And associated to this guy, because G acts on our symplectic manifold, we can get the associated bundle uh, over D2 with the structure with the fiber being M. Okay, so this is the counterpart of this fiber bundle. So it's a fiber bundle with fiber D2 here, A of sigma is just M. Notice that of course, because I'm working over D2, this one of course can be also trivialized. Um, and the counterpart of this m omega mu is going to be a of sigma with the um, with the symplectic structure that we talk about. And mu is going to be the moment map of the action of the automorphism group, which was start to of f f uh, and uh, you know, curvature of the connection f a. Okay, and it turns out that now once you think about this, in fact, that's how I think these equations were. Uh, developed so you can give see that these equations here motivate some equation in this more generality that uh, you can take a connection on p this is going to be the analog of zeta here and a section of this bundle so it's a map from d2 to, to into this principal bundle so this is the analog of alpha here and and the symplectic vortex equation is gonna be the generalization of this equation. So the first equation here can be uh, identified as some sort of D bar equation, but it's twisted with this connection here. So it's D bar of alpha with respect to this connection zeta is equal to zero. And the second equation here tells us that if we take the curvature of this connection, so it's a two form on D2, 
And if you take the star of the guy, so it becomes a zero form with values in the, the algebra, plus mu, uh, mu of u is equal to zero. So this is the analog of the, this is the counterpart of this term. Remember that the moment map in this setup was the uh, curvature. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about the ACD equation, at least in a case that your four manifold is d2 times sigma. Now let me go back to the theorem and say that what is the strategy of the proof? So this is gonna, I think Kenji will talk more about the details of this, but I wanna say what is this strategy and uh, what, it, what sort of geometrical object we wanna construct out of this. So both of these two invariants, they are both filtered invariants. And you can look at, okay, so you have a filtration, so that would induce a speckle sequence. So you have a speckle sequence from a certain invariant on this side to this invariant, and a speckle sequence from this guy to this guy. It turns out that, okay, so this, this invariants, the, the second page of the speckle sequence are actually, at least you know, in, in nice situations, they, are, uh, they can be uh, identified and in terms of the representations or flat connections on this bundle. And you can see directly that these are the same. In nice situations, these are just groups of the same rank as the elements of the um, character variety of the E tilde, uh, you know, the character variety associated with this SO3 bundle and Y tilde. Um, so one way to approach this, um, you know, to prove the theorem, that's, and, you know, the way that we approach the theorem is to construct some map from, um, you know, instant of lower homology to the symplectic variant of this guy, just the homomorphism, so that the induced map on the second page is an isomorphism, okay? Once you do that, just the general properties of a spectral sequences would imply that this map is also an isomorphism. So once you get an isomorphism here, which we, you know that you know, these guys are uh, kind of, you know, uh, these, are, these are objects that you understand quite easily, you can understand quite easily. So there's a better hope that to construct some, you know, do you already know some isomorphism. So if you can construct some homomorphism here, which is compatible with the filtration and, and this second page of the spherical sequence is it induces the structure that you want, then you win. So you get the isomorphism that you want. But I mean, as a part of this, you need to be able to, so if you wanna perform this strategy, you need to construct some homomorphism from some theory, which is defined in terms of AS the equation to some theory, which is defined in terms of the holomorphic curve equation or uh, cauchy riemann equation. So you should be able to find a way to relate ASD equation and cauchy riemann equation. And okay, so let's look at some, uh, so we're gonna, you know, to, to, to relate these two equations, we're gonna try to construct some geometrical equation uh, which relates these two guys. But let's first look at two toy examples. Let's first say that we wanna relate cauchy riemann equations on two different symplectic manifolds. So this is something that we know how to do it. And here, when I say cauchy riemann equations and two different symplectic manifolds, I really mean that like, you know, maybe, you know, for instance, you wanna relate Lagrangian floor homology on one symplectic manifold to Lagrangian homology, floor homology on different symplectic manifolds. So your, the key object to do such a thing is, is a Lagrangian correspondence. So if you have a Lagrangian correspondence from um, some symplectic manifold M0 to M1, then what you can do is that you can look at um, holomorphic uh, coils uh, to as a way as you know some sort of uh, equation which allows you to relate the simple you know holomorphic curve theory on one symplectic manifold to holomorphic curve theory on the other symplectic manifold. So locally, what you do is that you look at a two-dimensional disk and you divide it into two halves to half disk. So you map, um, you know, in this picture, the left-hand side into M0. You map, you look at the maps from the right-hand side to M1, and you require um, both of these two guys are holomorphic curves. So they satisfy the, the bar equation, 
And now to have something well defined, you have to specify what you do at the boundary uh, or boundary of each of these half disks, which is the, uh, the border line between these two guys. And what you require is that, okay, so U0 at the point here and U1 at the point here goes to L. Okay, so that, I mean, that's, that's a key idea and an important theory um, of, you know, uh, maps, you know, homomorph, you know, morph, you know, homorphism induced by Lagrangian correspondences developed by Woodward, Werheim, and you know, maybe several other names. But uh, so that's that's you know the underlying construction here. But what I want to okay, so I want to look at one special case of this construction. So let's look at a case that M zero is a Hamiltonian G action with a moment map uh, U. Then you can take M1 to be the symplectic quotient. And there's a nice choice of uh, Lagrangian correspondence in this case. In this case, you can take the Lagrangian correspondence, which consists of pairs in the product that uh, the first term is in mu inverse of zero, mu of X is equal to zero. And the second term, which is in the symplectic quotient, uh, is a call to the class which is uh, realized by this guy. Okay, so that's our first toy example. The second toy example is going to be relating Cauchy Riemann equation to the symplectic vortex equation. Um, so the setup is going to be the same as the case that we have symplectic vortex equation. So we have um, some symplectic manifold together with the moment map. Uh, associated to some Hamiltonian G action. Uh, we have a principal G bundle. Okay, let me, okay, so we have a principal G bundle over on the disk D minus and um, associated to this guy, we would get a principal, uh, you know, fiber bundle with fiber being our symplectic manifold. M. Now I wanna consider some equation, some, uh, uh, some sort of equations, uh, which is similar to the case of uh, Lagrangian correspondences. So first you have a connection on this bundle P. Uh, you have a section of this bundle, which is over defined over D minus and a map from D plus to the symplectic quotient. Okay. And what you do is that you require zeta and U minus satisfies the symplectic vortex equation. And this U plus, which is a map to um, symplectic quotient, it satisfies the D-bar equation. So this is just the ordinary D-bar equation. But again, the important thing here is to impose the correct condition at the borderline. So what you require is that for any point in the borderline, if you look at U minus of that point, you require that guy to be in the kernel of the mu, mu of that guy is zero. Also, if you look at U plus of that point, you require that that would be the same as the one, the class which is realized by this U minus of zero and T. Uh, without, you know, trying to state any precise theorem here, you, you would hope that, okay, so this sort of equations can be used to relate um, structures, algebraic packages, which are defined in terms of symplectic vortex equation to algebraic packages that you define in terms of cauchy riemann equation. And it improves some of the theorems which are already proved. But this motivates some equation, which is gonna be the key role, uh, play the key role for us at the geometrical uh, level. So it's the mixed equation to introduced by Lipiansky. Uh, so what it does is that it relates AST equation to cauchy riemann equation. And this is just the infinite dimensional analog of this guy, making the observation that AST equation is an infinite dimensional version of um, symplectic vortex equation. So it's a equation for a pair of a connection on D minus times sigma. And you have um, a map from D plus to the character variety they're supposed to satisfy. So the connection A is supposed to be AST. So this is the infinite dimensional symplectic vortex equation here. 
and U is supposed to be um, uh, holomorphic, and so the deep bar of U is equal to zero. And then the, the, the last important, the last piece of information, which is very important here is this uh, condition at the border lines that if you look at some point here and you restrict your connection to sigma times that point, that connection is supposed to be flat. So this is the analog of moment map condition. And so you have a flat connection you, that represents some element here. And what you want is that you want to require that you at that point is the same as this guy. And I should wanna, okay, I'm running over time. So let me just uh, finish up very quickly by saying that there is a similar question, similar equation, which is defined by Wurham and uh, later studied by Wurham and Solomon. And <clears throat> it's basically half of this picture. So you're looking at, there is no uh, T bar equation. So it's a AST equation, but the, um, in, the boundary equation here is going to be some Lagrangian equations, I think, because of don't have that much time left. Let me just finish by saying that, you know, um, an important thing is that this mixed equation is defined in the correct way so that you have some familiar analytical properties. And these are discussed in one of the two papers uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, beginning of the talk. So, the modular space of solutions to the mixed equation, they admit some co nice compactification, which is similar to Gromov and Ulenbeck compactification. Um, they consist of regular so solutions, so any solution is uh, smooth, even uh, you know, at the borderline. Um, and so these two things were already addressed by Lipinski, where he introduced that point. And you know, in this paper, we basically, I guess, we, um, you know, Lipinski's paper was unpublished. We, uh, you know, we write the, you know, basically, you know, the same proofs for one and two, and we also show that this equation also is governed by some Fred Holm operations. And I should say that all of the proofs here also, you know. Uh, I mean, an important source of inspiration uh, for us is, uh, you know, the analysis of this sort of equation, uh, as the equation with Lagrangian boundary uh, value, which is uh, introduced by Warheim and Solomon. Okay, I think I'm, uh, because I'm running over time, let me stop here. I'm just gonna, uh, this is the slide that I said I probably won't be able to make uh, to this slide. I'm just gonna put it there in case somebody wants to look at it. I'll let me stop here. Okay, let's give Ali a hand. Questions? Yeah, Ali, can you, can you say a little bit about the um, why this spin structure is an issue? Are, are you saying that it's not even clear that they have relative spin structures? Uh, it is, well, I mean, it's, yeah, we, we, to be honest, we didn't uh, try think too hard about it. I mean, there are some ideas to try to construct that, but yeah, like it's not, I mean, one, one way of trying to construct this relative spin structure is that like trying to decompose your manifold into some smaller pieces such right. that you, uh, that are like, you know, given by handle additions and try to construct some for each of these Lagrangians construct. Uh, you know, spin structure or relative spin structure, mm -hmm. and then show that they compose nicely with each other. But then you, you also have to, this way you would get one way of orienting your moduli spaces. And you want to show that when, you know, at the end of the day, you also want to show that this sort of orientations are, well, you have to do it in a canonical way so that they also fit nicely with the equation that, you know, the SD equation or maybe the better way of saying it is that with the mixed equation. Uh, yeah, we didn't do that. We just, um, what we showed is that like, there is a, uh, we basically use the mixed equation to show that there is a nice coherent or orientation for the modular spaces, which might or might not be the same as, uh, you know, orientation, which is coming from, you know, some spin structure on your Lagrangian. So we didn't show, I mean, there are some ideas to show that there are like some spin structures, some even, you know, some canonical spin structures, but we didn't 
try to do that. We're doing it in an, uh, this in this paper, we did it in an indirect way of, you know, just showing that there is like the modular spaces admin some Korean orientations. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. More questions. I had a question. Um, so uh, Lagrangian floor homology has a natural, you know, categorical composition. Um, is this expected to correspond to a certain multiplication on instanton floor homology? And does um, this method of approach shed light on the comparison? Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I think Kenji is going to talk about that next week. But yeah, so there is like a, I don't, yeah. I probably should, maybe we should he's going to tell you more of a you know, better answer to this question. But yeah, roughly speaking, yeah, the answer is yes. And uh, you, yeah, so this, um, you know, you can use uh, the same method uh, to try to make comparisons between A infinity structure on one side and A infinity structure on the other side. So there are like, uh, on the gauge theory side, there are this A infinity, there is the A infinity structure, which goes back. I think to Donaldson and Fukaya, uh, where we use families of metrics to define um, uh, A infinity structure, and that corresponds to the you know, just A infinity multiplication and you know, Fukaya categories of you know, simply you know, Lagrangian in say symplectic manifold. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a question. Um, so, so this version of a Tia Fleur conjecture has been around for a while, and people have thought a lot about it. And I was wondering if the sort of key technical innovation that let you guys prove this is it correct that it's that bullet number three working out the Fredholm theory for the mixed equation? Um, well, uh, let's see. So I think I would say that like. The key point goes to this strategy, and uh, like um, maybe it's not like in terms of. I think the key, I, uh, the key points is that like okay, so you would get first. I mean, I basically I talk about this, these equations locally. I mean, uh, we. I think next time Kenji would talk about the correct global version, which is gonna uh, give this map N. And uh, like, you know, just, you know, what, um, you know, that, that that map induces the correct, you know, it induces an isomorphism at the level of this series and that would, um, you know, compatible with the filtration. So that's, I think, you know, I mean, in that, of course, you know, the construction that this geometrical object are at the heart of the construction. So they are important and they're already, um, you know, uh, there, are, there are variations of some other constructions uh, which, um, you know, already exist in the literature. Uh, so I would say that like these three points that I mentioned here, Sorry for going between the slides very quickly, but these three points here, uh, there are, like I said, a great source of inspiration is um, the, um, the work of Berham and um, Solomon and the Lagrangian, and ASD equation with Lagrangian boundary condition. Um, so like the proofs are modeled uh, you know, after the proofs, but like, you know, the thing that, how to use these modular spaces to get the isomorphism, that's probably, you know, um, one of the new parts, especially, I mean, I mean, Kenji is gonna talk about it. There's a, like a boundary condition, there's a condition at the infinity that you have to impose. So that's, it's important. What is the right condition for that? I'll, I'll let, you know, Kenji, uh, maybe to give a better answer to your question, but it's, it's more like, you know, the, uh, the new um, contribution is, you know, the more important contribution is in the in the other half of the talk, which Kenji is going to talk about. Okay, thanks. Sure. Okay. I don't know if Kenji wants to make a comment here right now, or 
he just wants to talk about it next week, save it. Maybe he wanna save it for next week. You're muted, Kenji. I think one thing is that we use kind of cobaltism argument more systematically. And for a long time, people try to use some more analytic, adiabatic argument. Mm. That's a kind of change of point of view. Okay, thank you. Uh, any any last question for Ali? Okay, let's give Ali another hand. Thank you.